Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Sunday morning service. Uh, be blessed, I pray, and uh, as we join together in worshipping our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and as we hear his word spoken to us and expounded to us here this morning. I want to begin uh, from Habakkuk 3 and uh, verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame, and I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In our time, make them known, and in wrath, remember to show compassion. Amen. So let's pray. Father, may we not turn aside from following our Lord Jesus Christ. But may we serve him with all of our hearts. May we not turn aside to go after worthless things, which do not profit or deliver, which have no enduring worth. All of the works of the flesh are evident, all kinds of wickedness, not least of which is lawlessness and hostility toward the things of God. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But of the fruit of the Spirit, love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against all these things there is no law. They show forth the fruit of an everlasting life. So let us remember your works, Lord, your works of years gone by, your works of today, and your works which you have foretold will come to pass. Let us meditate on these things and consider all your mighty deeds. Father, you are holy, so may we be holy also. You have revealed your strength among your people. You have redeemed them with power. You have commissioned your church. Blessed be your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And so here's Ben this morning uh, with the reading from Matthew 28. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's really good to be here with you guys again this morning, and I trust that you've been really blessed this week. So today's reading is from Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. And now I'd like to call Johnson to come and share his message for today. Thank you, Johnson. Good morning, church. Uh, today is Trinity Sunday, according to our church tradition. And... Um, I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our theme today is this last command, our first concern. This last command, our first concern. Uh, last words are important. Let that uh, truth sink in our minds. Last words are very important. Listen again to some of the last words of Jesus. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. My theme is his last command, our first concern. So these last ways of Jesus to his disciples 
represent the marching orders that are to be followed until he returns. There is no more powerful motivational text for Christian mission and evangelistic zeal. And yet, this text is not shaping the ministry and mission of some of our churches. Could that be the primary cause for the crisis of our churches today? Maybe by not following the command of Jesus Christ. In Galilee, the reason Lord Jesus appeared to his disciples at an unnamed mountain. This is the same appearance recorded in Mark 16, verse 15 and 18. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, what a wonderful re reunion with his disciples. His sufferings were passed off forever. Because he lived, they too would live. He stood before them in his glorified body. They worshipped the living, loving Lord, though doubts still lagged in the minds of some. In verse 18, the Lord explained that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. In one sense, of course, he always had all authority. But he was speaking of authority as the head of the new creation. Since his death and resurrection, he had authority to give eternal life to all whom he had given to him. In John 17 verse 2. He had always had power as the firstborn of all creation. But now that he had completed the work of redemption, he had authority as the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have the preeminence in Colossians 1 verse 5 and 18. As the head of the new creation, he then issued the great commission containing standing orders for all believers during the present phase of the kingdom. So the time between the rejection of the king and his second advent, the commission contains three commands. They are not suggestions, but three commands which are being given. And I'm going to dwell on these three commands. The first one, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This does not presuppose world conversion. By preaching the gospel, the disciples were to see others become learners or followers of the Savior from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. So there is that little imperative word, go. And then all of these those words like make, baptize, teach, obey, that follow, that sort of make it like military marching orders. So go is such a simple word with a simple meaning. Don't just stand there. Do something. We use it to start races. On your mark, get set, go. So there's not a racer anywhere who hearing those words and hearing the starting pistol says, who? Oh, is it me or someone else? You have to run because they've been told to go. Go. When he called the disciples, he said, come. Come, follow me. At the end of his mission, he said, go. Which means he's now instructing us to do something. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. Most people don't expect to talk, to talk about your faith or be involved in witnessing. But you know what? You are exactly who Jesus had chosen. God has chosen you so that you can be his witness. Jesus called fishermen, text collectors, and everyday ordinary kind of people. He didn't have a single Pharisee, Sadducee, or a priest, or a Levite on his staff. It was all run by the late. And after Pentecost, their ministry exploded. Christopher Wright says, those who know God are required to make God known. And that requires the medium of ways as well as deeds. There are things to be said, there are stories to be told, the affirmations and the truth claims, warnings and challenges, and announcements and appeals. So it takes disciples to make disciples. The shepherd doesn't reproduce, but sheep reproduce. And Jesus has spent three years teaching his disciples what it meant to be one. It involved practical down-to-earth lessons on life, attitudes, behavior, trust, forgiveness, love, generosity, obedience to Jesus, and count cultural actions towards others. So the first thing we do is trust the spirit of the risen Lord and trust the Holy Spirit and trust the miracle of God who works in our lives in such a way that our lives are transformed into an invitation to a relationship with God through Christ. You see, we can't force or make anybody, anyone be a disciple of Christ. But we can pray for them, and in that prayer we can ask God to enter their lives in such a way that Jesus becomes real, and their relationship with God grows deep. 
And then ask God for the right ways and the power of God's spirit to speak to them with the opportunity when opportunity arises. So we can engage in conversation about their faith and their relations with God in a non-condemning manner. We can encourage, we can invite, we can offer counsel, but we leave the hard work there, hard work up to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You see, we are not on some sort of spiritual magic mission. We are there to encourage people to come to Christ. Why should we witness? Why should we do it? Yes, Jesus had commanded it, but there is some more reasons. We want others to know and experience the love of God, which we have experienced too. We want others to experience the same forgiveness and the new life we have experienced through Christ's death and resurrection that we have. Listen to the words of Dr. S.M. Lockridge. He says, the Bible says, my king is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of the ages. He is the king of heaven. He is the king of glory. He is the king of kings. And he is the lord of lords. Now, that's my king. Well, I wonder, do you know him? My king is sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limited love. He is insurance strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast. He is mortally graceful. He is imperially powerful. He is impartially merciful. Do you know him? That's the question. He is the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is God's son. He is the sinner savior. He is the center prize of civilization. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He is the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He is available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He believes. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He saves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent and the beautifies the maker. I wonder if you know him. He is the key to knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is the pathway of peace. He is the roadway of righteousness. He is the highway of holiness. He is the gateway of glory. Do you know him? That is my king. Well, his life is meshless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He is indescribable. He is incomprehensible. He is invisible. He is irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yes, that's my king. That's my king. Could he be yours too? Then he said, go and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So the responsibility rests on Christ's messengers to teach baptism and to praise it as a command to be obeyed. In believers' baptism, Christians publicly identify themselves with the triune Godhead. So they, they acknowledge that God is their Father, that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and that the Holy Spirit is the one who indwells and empowers and teaches them. Name in verse 19 is singular. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they went to baptize everyone who believed and do it in the name of the Father, so the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the gospel and salvation through Jesus was flowing out of the Trinity and in line with ages, old mission of, of, uh, mission of God. God is a missionary God. So it makes sense that Jesus sent his followers in the church just as he has sent his son. Baptism is a declaration or a sign that new believers are fully identified with Christ. And what? After baptizing them, he said, and you need to teach them to obey all my commands. So there is teaching which is needed now. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. The commission goes beyond evangelism. 
It is not enough to simply make converts and let them fend for themselves. They must be taught to obey the commandments of Christ as found in the New Testament. So the essence of discipleship is becoming like the master. So this is brought out by the systematic teaching of and submission to the word of God. Then the Savior added a promise of his presence with his disciples until the consummation of the age. They would not go forth alone or unaided. In all their service, travel, they would know the companionship of the Son of God. Most of us don't like the word evangelism, but it is our primary mission. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am always with you to the end of the age. We have to go. That's part of being a disciple. But we are called to remember that we don't go alone. God is with us. Christ is with us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is with us. And we need to remember that we don't have a communicable disease. We have a communicable cure of sin, loneliness, law of esteem, lack of purpose, lack of direction, and guilt. And what we want to do is infect everyone we meet. Thus the gospel closes with commission and comfort from our glorious Lord. Over 20 centuries later, his words have the same questions, the same reverence, the same application. The task is too uncompleted. What are we doing to carry out his last command? Are we doing what he has called us to do? This has been a gospel of action. Now he's telling us to get into action. We are to go. And by the way, he is saying to us today that we should be men and women of action for God. What are you doing today to get out the word of God? That is our business, my friend. You should have been some part of in getting the word of God out today. It's time to go, to go out and preach the word of God and tell everyone about Christ. Not in the manner that is threatening, but in a loving manner of witnessing, telling the story about how your life has been changed. My life has been changed because of Christ, Jesus Christ. So that's the story I'm going out with. I'm telling people about how Christ came into my life. And that story is the one you need to go out with. Tell others. Let us not be comfortable be in our churches without going out. Christ has called us to go out. And that is the reason why we need to take it seriously. It is Christ's command. And it is now it becomes our concern. Yes, we are concerned about it because that is the reason why Christians are called. We are called to go with the word of God. God, the Father, sent his son Jesus Christ. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is sending us too. We are going now through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not going on our own, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, we know we are going. May the good Lord bless us as we start going out, reaching to others, telling them about Christ. That is the command that has been given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I'll ask um, Pastor Chris to now come and uh, lead us in Holy Communion. Uh, thank you. Well, good morning again, everyone, as we come together to take Holy Communion as the people of faith. So this would be a good time now to uh, pause this video and go and collect your own uh, elements, your communion elements together in your home, uh, the bread and the juice, and uh, I'm going to wait right here until you come back. Okay, so you're back and ready, and so I want to begin uh, our time together reflecting on a couple of things uh, before we share this meal together. One of the lessons we can draw from the story of Israel, particularly in the Old Testament, is that they failed God a lot. And so the lesson for us is striving not to repeat their failures uh, in our own lives, and also uh, that we strive to remain a part of the faithful remnant that God is preserving for his glory. 
But of course, the, the reality is, is that we do fail God sometimes. And if we're truthful, we know that we fail him more often than not, uh, more often than we realize. And so we sometimes have uh, doubts in our standing before God. And this can easily, easily overwhelm us, particularly at times like this, when we come before God's table. And so I want to ask you, what do you see when you look in the mirror? The Apostle Paul tells us that what we see in the mirror is not what we really are. We see only a poor reflection of ourselves, but God, on the other hand, he sees us perfectly and very differently from the way that we see ourselves. In the, first, in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 and verse 12, Paul explains it in these words. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So what Paul is saying here is that God knows us as we truly are, and as uh, he has actually made us to be in Jesus Christ. But we have only a really a little bit of an inkling of that, a poor reflection, just like a dusty old mirror. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, Paul goes on and he says something else very profound. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So when we look in this mirror, we probably don't see the new us, that the, the, the us that is seated with Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. What we usually see when we look in the mirror, if we're being honest, is we see the struggling sinner that we know we all are. But Paul says that we have died and we have been raised with Christ, past tense. And this new life we have in Christ is for now hidden. And when Christ appears, then he says we will appear with him as we really are, the way he has already made us to be in him. So this means we do not have to get salvation or even to get righteous or to become moral or better, you know, as, and all of the baggage that goes with that. Throughout the New Testament, Paul says this, he admonishes us to behave righteously because we are already in Christ. He never tells us to behave righteously in order for Christ to accept us. Jesus Christ died for us so that while we were still sinners, Paul says in Romans 5, 6, and we were reconciled to God while we were still his enemies, as he says in verse 10. So to this end, the Holy Spirit is working in us, leading us into the new life of abundance that God has given us in Jesus Christ. Not to help us to measure up or somehow attain something, to attain salvation, but rather to help us to learn how we are already made in the image of Jesus Christ. We are a new creation. We are already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. So I want you to think about this as we take this communion together. The next time we look in the mirror, as we come before this table, let's take a moment to think about how God sees us. He sees us as his beloved children, forgiven, clean, reconciled, and made new in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now these thoughts that I've just shared should encourage us and cause us to offer our prayer in grateful thanks. And so let's now do just that. Heavenly Father, sometimes we come to this table in unbelief, not quite believing that through Jesus Christ we are already counted as your children, forgiven, clean, 
reconciled and that we are made new in him. So help our unbelief, Lord, so that we can come to this table this morning as, as, as uh, you, through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, draw us together in communion with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit, that we will come in peace and assurance that we are your much-loved children. We ask this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are together this morning. We are family together. Our Lord uh, showed us that as we come to this table and we share these, uh, these elements, the sacred meal together, we partake with, these, uh, with this, uh, these elements of the bread and the fruit of the vine. And we do all of this recognizing who we are in Jesus Christ. And we do it with grateful thanks. And we remember Jesus as he commanded us so to do. So the bread we take is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup that we take is a sharing in the blood of Jesus Christ. So receive the holy sacrament of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. So the feast of the Lord is ready. And so I'd ask you to, uh, in your homes, to uh, take the elements that you have, the bread and the juice that you've prepared and put aside. I'd ask you to take that in your own time and uh, always do so giving thanks. And uh, we're going to pause now and uh, take those elements and uh, I'll join you back here in just a few moments. Okay, so we've taken the elements together, um, even though we may be in our own homes and uh, may not feel the same as when we normally meet together, but uh, be sure that we have shared the body of Jesus Christ with one another and uh, taken uh, Holy Communion uh, together in thanks. So let's finish up in prayer. We thank you, God our Father, that through your word and sacrament, you have given us your Son, who is the true bread of heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service, we pray, that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So just to uh, remind those of you who normally worship uh, here in this building on Sunday, uh, that uh, each and every Sunday we normally uh, share communion together and at the time we do that we normally take up uh, two offerings our general offering and the other one to support those who are less privileged uh, than we are and who are in need of assistance. I also just want to add a note of thanks for all those who have been giving faithfully. Unlike many churches we are in a better position financially than we might have otherwise expected. But please continue to give your gifts. Make it uh, possible for us to continue this work, this uh, amazing work that God is doing, um, doing good things in this community, but also in an online community around the world as these videos are viewed by, by uh, people of faith, but also by seekers after the word. So wherever they may be, your blessings give them. So let's pray for the offering. Father God, Father, when we give, when we give of our time, 
when we give of our money, when we give of our resources, this honours you. It brings you glory. And Lord, we are so desirous to honour you and to give you glory. And so we bring our gifts, the gifts that you have given to us. Each and every one of us has talents. Every, every, each and every one of us has gifts of the Holy Spirit. Each of any, every one of us has been given resources and asked to steward these faithfully in your name. And so, Father, as we bring our gifts, we do so in grateful thanks because we know that in doing this, we do bring you honour and we do bring you glory. So multiply these gifts, we pray, that we can continue to do an amazing work here in this community, but also online around the world as people watch and view these videos everywhere. We thank you in Christ's holy name. Amen. Let us receive benediction. May the grace of the Father be with you. May the love of the Son enfold you, and may the peace of the Spirit comfort you today and always as we continue to go out with the Word of God. Let us not be afraid. God is with us. In Jesus' name, amen.